but what, what's what's your sense of it all this is a really impressive thing it's not something i've had a lot of experience with. we don't uh, my my career background has not been a lot with enforcement it's been a lot more on the on the on the practicing mm -hmm. of kind of ahl versus the you know the the back end of enforcement of ahl so you, how did you get into the military was it your was your dad a military guy no no the other way around he, he was in the uh he was in the national guard to avoid being drafted he said no i i guess i'd always been interested in it and then um a cr crazy story i uh i had a, a girlfriend in high school and uh we broke up and i thought you know i don't want to stick around here all summer while she dates somebody else so i went down and, and talked to the, the the army reserve recruiter i was a junior in high school and they had this deal where you could go your junior between your junior and senior year to basic training and they talked to him about what branch and he said uh well do you like you know shooting guns and hiking in the woods and camping out i said yeah how, how much you have to pay to do that he's like no we'll pay you you know so um so I, that's how I wound up being in the infantry, and, and there's a classic things that happen. I did that. I signed up, agreed to go, and then like two weeks later, made up with a girlfriend, and then didn't want to be gone or something. <laughs> but uh, I walked in, you know, worked out. So I did that, junior, senior year, went to basic training, came back, finished senior year of high school, uh, and uh, then went back for infantry training the next summer. And that was in the Army Reserve. Uh, about three years later, two years later, went to the... National Guard went to the OCS Officer Cannon School and was commissioned uh, again as infantry and then did that through the rest of college and law school. After I finished law school, came on active duty as a JAG officer. And Where do you go to law school? University of Arkansas. Okay. And there you become a military guy, ultimately do your law school, become part of the JAG. Mm -hmm. uh, 30 years as a JAG officer. Did, yeah. did you prosecute? Did you defend? Oh, yeah. So both, yeah, like a lot of Army Jags, prosecuted and defended. Um, as a young, I did defense first, uh, so I did things called legal assistance, where you're helping soldiers with com consumer and family law and stuff like that for about probably about eight months, and then moved over to be a defense counsel. Wanted to be a prosecutor first. That was a typical path. They told me I have to wait a while if I wanted to do that, and I said I, I'd rather get in court now, so I went to be a defense. Um, about a year into that, there was a, I was in Germany, and there was a significant uh, murder case that happened there. And the, the two guys that were more experienced had already been assigned to a murder case that a uh, guy killed his baby, and so they were tied up. So I was sitting in the office one day, and our senior, the, the, I was a captain, and they said very junior, the lieutenant colonel called me and said, uh, hey, there's a guy and, uh, he, you know, outside the dining facility and had a knife, and I'm thinking, okay, it's probably an assault. And then he's like, uh, the guy had had a, was having an affair with his wife. I'm like, okay. And then he cut off the head and took it. Uh, I'm like, wait a minute, did you say cut off a head? <laughs> and, um, yeah, so this guy in front of a guy named Stephen Shap, sorry, Shap, had uh, cut off the head of another soldier right up in, kind of in front of the, the dining facility at dinner time in Germany in December, so it's dark. People thought it was just a fight until the head came rolling away. So it was uh, kind of ice pick motions more than, than sawing, but uh, then they said he got up and was kicking the body, and then the head came off, and he picked it up, and he said, this is what you get for committing adultery, and took the head and walked to his car, went to the hospital, the German hospital, where his wife was, uh, because she was uh, there in the, having some complications with a pregnancy that wasn't he knew wasn't his, and took the head in and put it on the little tray table that goes around by your bed to eat your meals off of. And, uh, she screamed, the doctors came in, they looked in, they left, the polizai came in and they grabbed him and drug him out. And so I remember getting that call and needing, they said, well, you need to drive up full. It was about two hours away, so you need to drive up, meet with the guy, find out, you know, kind of make sure he doesn't talk, kind of get the case started. And um, a lot of people won't know what Paul Harvey is, but you probably remember Paul oh, Harvey. So I'm listening to AFN radio over there and driving up, and, um, and I hear Paul Harvey, this has happened the day before, Paul Harvey is, is talking about it on the radio, and I thought, what the heck have I, I'm way over my head. 
Um, but it was during the, that time in Germany, we had, a, we had about 300,000 army soldiers there when I got there. And they were, they were leaving at thousands of days, every, you know, doing the drawdown in, in, in Europe after the Cold War. And so everybody was leaving and you needed to get around and start interviewing witnesses and finding the unit was closing down and people were leaving every day. And uh, fortunately, uh, the family had money and they asked me like, well, if we wanted to hire a civilian attorney, can you recommend one? And a guy named Dave Cord had been over there trying cases for years as an as a American civilian, trying court martials. And I worked with him on a couple of cases and, and recommended him to the family and they ended up uh, hiring Dave and we tried the case together I learned a, an awful lot but kind of was a kind of a heat of passion sort of defense yeah, yeah. Um, the guy ended up being convicted of, of premeditated murder a good friend of mine was a prosecutor um, and I, they didn't necessarily but they thought it barely met the elements of premeditated murder so they um, when they when they came back in and the judge said okay well now that has a mandatory sentence of life there was uh, they were really upset uh, our, our panel what we would call it a, a jury we call them panels in the military and they came back and and, and said this a judge said you have no choice on the jail sentence it's, it's it's at the time it was life with parole but still but the commanding general could approve the sentence in less than that so they said can we make a recommendation so they recommended i think 15 years which was still pretty high for a heat of passion, but that was, that was still something. And I think the commanding general approved 25. So that still made Sergeant Schaap eligible. He didn't get parole then probably, but eligible at 10 years so in our system. So he's probably out for by now. Did you, did you work in the military uh, law and obviously have some comparative law analysis with mm -hmm our common law system and state statutory system. Is there much difference due process wise? Uh, no, uh, not significant. In some ways you get more rights as a soldier than you do as a civilian. The um, perhaps the biggest is, is in the area of like Miranda rights. Uh, so civilian, you're gonna have to have interrogate uh, and a custodial interrogation. In the military, we have to read Article 31 rights uh, whenever you question somebody if you believe, that if you have reasonable cause to believe they've committed an offense. So that's a commander, a sergeant, police, I mean anybody. So there's no uh, custody requirement for that. They, uh, they're also entitled to uh, pay for a defense lawyer. There's no uh, indigency requirements to be shown. So you've got, um, like I said, there's just, they're, they're gonna get I think a higher protection of rights. The Army is pretty paternalistic about taking care of soldiers in that regard. And this defense council can be a civilian as well as military, right? Can be. So your your choice, um, if you if you you can you're going to get military assigned, and you can hire a civilian. So, um, but you can also make a specific request for a certain military attorney that you may have known or heard about, and there's. We were pretty liberal in granting those, and there would have to be almost a good cause to show why that person couldn't go do that. And there, there's jobs, deployments, other reasons why you couldn't go do it, but but we they try to be pretty generous in granting those. And so, In your teachings, uh, do you do much comparative analysis of what's going on in Guantanamo? We don't do much with that right now. <laughs> I'm not sure there's much going on in Guantanamo. Um, it, it's an interesting, it is interesting. I mean, I have some friends uh, both on the defense side of that. A guy I've worked with is one of, he's a reserve officer that, in the army that works on the defense. Uh, I talked to him quite a bit. And then the, uh, the senior prosecutors, a guy named uh, Brigadier General Mark Martins is a former boss and uh, not close friend, but friend of mine. Occasionally I see him at things and we talk about kind of what's going on on the prosecution side. He's been doing that. Gosh, he's been now, in modern times, he's probably the longest serving Brigadier General uh, we've had. I think he was, he was probably promoted in maybe 2008. Third deployment I did was, oh, got there in May of 2006, left in June 2007. And, and uh, MNFI, Multinational Force Iraq, 
Uh, Mark Martins was a colonel, it was the SJ at the time. I was a, a lieutenant colonel and we were, uh, I, I was down at the embassy where General Casey was our senior commander at the time, a four star. And uh, there were three other one stars, the way it was divided up. And that was really kind of my client, Martin sort of dealt with Casey. And he would have dealt with his issues, but he happened to be home on leave over the, the holidays. He, I, I went home that year around Thanksgiving, and he went home around Christmas and New Year's, where you got two weeks to go back. And so uh, during the Christmas holidays, they, uh, 2006, uh, they were, were getting ready to, to get to the kind of the final stages. Saddam had been convicted. And they were looking at it actually executing him. He finishes appeals all pretty quick, but in, in Iraq court, the regime's crime tribunal. And so they, there was, um, there was, they were any day about to do the, his execution. What I really this remember. This is Hussein, right? Hussein. Mm -hmm. okay. They were going to do a hanging, um, and, and there was, um, there were questions about, some issues about how do we, did the U.S. actually have custody? There was questions about whether in the U.S. certain groups that didn't believe in the death penalty were going to try to file um, motions in U.S. court to try to stop this. And, and there was, so we were getting asked questions by our senior commander, by General Casey. By the way, he was being tried in a domestic court, right? So he was, there was a, um, it, yeah, it was domestic, it was, but it, it was set up for the purpose. So they called it, um, the regime's try crimes tribunal. And I know Mike Scharf was part of the yeah. experts witnesses are trying to set that up there. Yeah. yeah, so they were looking at all the Iraqi people. It was tried by Iraq uh, judges. But but with somebody like Saddam, you know, I wouldn't say it's a, it was probably a best term. It was probably almost like a legal fiction that he was in Iraq custody. So we, we had uh, we had the facility but we probably had, and we have, I'm sure we had U.S. guards whenever there was an Iraqi guard around him as well. And, uh, but they had legal custody of him. And they were going to be the ones to carry out the execution. So again, I was asked, uh, General Fassman was our chief of ops, um, a two-star. He asked, uh, and General Casey was asking, what, what do we do? How do we prevent this? I was working with a, a lady named Mary DeMille, who was a, a young State Department lawyer over there uh, at the embassy. So we were kind of working through this. Martins was back on leave. That left me as a senior person there as a JAG for the trying to answer this. And uh, I, I never had to worry about how do you hang somebody? What do you do? Can, can they stop it in domestic court back in the U.S.? Um, how do we do it humanely? What's the procedure for that? How do we make sure they do it? How do we ensure he doesn't get away, but we don't take custody of him? Um, so a lot of, a lot of what I would say are novel legal issues. That we, I mean, that was um, that was probably marked my year. There is a lot of novel legal issues. So we did did um, did get that. They did file suit. We we were, I think we're correct in our determination that we were not that he would not be able to do that in the U.S. The U.S. law was not going to be able to hold that up. And on December the 30th, uh, they, Saddam was executed by the Iraq uh, the the Iraq government, and with they again they had they had custody of him legally, and. Uh, and that uh, was it, it after, you know, there's no appeal from, from the death penalty. So after that, everything kind of died down on that. We knew that there would be, there, there was going to be some official photos of proof of death. There, there, as it turned out, there were two videos at different times that, that kind of leaked out. Um, and one did show some damage to his neck. Um, but but that was uh, a lot of it was trying to decide if you, I mean, it sounds funny to say not funny I guess uh, strange you have to worry about but it, but if you there is a there there is sign of a, a science to, to hanging somebody where to do it humanely if you can ever hang someone humanely but the uh, the, the weight the, the the length of drop with the idea being that you you know you want to break the neck and kill someone instantly so you don't want them to just suffocate right. um, but 
but if you get that if you get that calculation off you're liable to cause a decapitation and they didn't they didn't want that either there is um, I don't know if it's still there I'm sure it probably is there was an army regulation at the time that still covered how to hang people uh, so that was helpful uh, there's a uh, in my experience there's probably an army regulation on everything if you just do enough research uh, that um, but there was one here so we had to do that we uh, we wanted to ensure he didn't he wasn't killed by other people committed or commit suicide you saw some of that in the Nuremberg uh, but also um, didn't want him to escape so you're you're concerned about you know are people bringing in in drug suit are they are they trying to get him out at the same time you don't want to take legal custody of him because then we would be subject to maybe lawsuits back in the U.S. that we've we now have uh, you know jurisdiction based on having this guy and doing these things so we needed to be able to to legitimately show in, in a court filing a hearing that, that we did not have custody of him. You observers was there in the I mean I saw the mm -hmm. video uh, <clears throat> And it was kind of chaotic, really, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, I kind of got crazy at the end. Yeah. Were there, was U.S. Uh, military, were they uh, there in the room observing? So we did have a couple of U.S. military in the room, but uh, MP. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not have, uh, MP officer. We did not have, that I know of, anybody really else with that. We had uh, our own guards that were, I mean, it's an enclosed, this was not an outdoor hanging. It's an indoor hanging. And so you had people that were security both outside the building, security inside the building, but but as far as in the room, uh, I think we, we were limited as to what we actually had. Again, it, it was not a U.S. operation, and and I say legal fiction. It, it's probably it's it, like a lot of things. It, it's a legal reality, but but we also wanted to make sure that that you know he had he had money, he had friends, and you know it, it, that he doesn't leave. We knew the date, as I recall, or at least about the time the execution was going to occur. Do you, do you, was that a fact? Did, it, did we did we know the time, or did it uh, did it sort of occur and it come out after the fact? I, I'm kind of vague about that. Yeah, um, I knew when it was going to be, but not way ahead of time. I and mean, we we knew where it was going to be. We knew, um, but but it wasn't publicized okay. when it was going to be. It was publicized after it occurred. And, and again, the idea is that, um, you know, there's, there's, there, there's still, still people there that would support him. Uh, not a lot in the current government, a lot, but here's a guy that probably had assets around the world somewhere. The other part of the advice was in how we stayed, again, how you stay with him but stay away from him. Yeah. And how do we, how do we do that? How do we shape that operation so that he doesn't get away, isn't able to, to commit suicide, doesn't have somebody else kill him, um, and, and which sounds that you're funny, you're really protecting somebody's life till you can hang them, but, but there, that, that was the, there was a, a lot of concern that that could have happened as well. Wow. Uh, do you reflect on this at all? Do you talk about this in your class? Do you, is this something that you... No. I, one of the things that I thought was really interesting from a from a, a U.S. perspective that that year, um, there's a lot of NRA National Rifle Association members in the military. Where um, the Jags are probably the liberal member of a very conservative family, but still pretty conservative. But it was really interesting to me that a lot of these uh, people who are very pro-gun rights in the U.S. We're absolutely convinced that the only way we were going to get security in Iraq was to do um, gun registration, and people had to have a weapons card with them at all time, and limit a certain type of weapon and a certain amount of ammunition. And we were in the midst of trying to help them figure out, you know, that program and how to do that, and the the successes and failures. And uh, I, I guess I grew up in, a, in a, a hunting household, but not really a gun for the sake of gun household. And, and but the irony was not lost on me that a lot of people who would think that you know don't whatever you do, I, I need my you know twelve pistols and you know five assault rifles back in the U.S. were willing to take away the guns of people who 
very legitimately could be drug out of their house and, and horribly killed. And, and in Baghdad in 2006, um, I mean, the death rate was pretty horrific of civilians uh, just being murdered uh, by each other, Sunni to Shia. Uh, they were running anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 a month, mm. probably was our, our death average mm. that we were expecting. Uh, it was a it was a brutally brutally deadly year for the if you were Iraq citizen and that was uh, they would if you went to the morgue to collect a body and they you signed in they could probably they would ask you to fill out where you you know your address and stuff to claim the body uh, if you were uh, you know, Shia or Sunni or the other side then they would come to your house and you know you'd be next bodies would go on claim the morgue was stacking up just because you, you'd be next if you went to do that. Um, really, really struggling with horrible, you know, torture. It's amazing what human beings will do to each other. Most of this wasn't for information even. It was um, just so people would know that that's what they did to you. And I mean, just crazy things. One of the things I have talked about in class, because I ha not much, but I've had questions people ask, is about whether or not um, is a jag. I've gotten you know you're in the army, whatever. Have you ever have you ever killed anybody? Um, I think the answer to that is depending on what you mean by how do you kill someone. Mm -hmm. And that, so for me, especially the year I was in Iraq, it was either none or at least a hundred. Um, we would, one of my jobs was part of a panel, we had about, about five people maybe, that would review intelligence, you're bringing in classified intelligence on people, mm -hmm. and you're trying to decide if there is enough to put them on the, you know, kill or capture your earliest convenience list, and, and you kind of know well, you're going to review 20 files a day, and um, if you put 15 people on the list and the next week by the time you're ready to do it again there's probably five ten of them that, that are dead um, is it is it uh, uh, the, the, you know the great question with that which is kind of I, I guess I think of it in a term of like diffuse responsibility so mm -hmm. is it is it the people that may have went out and said okay we you know we don't know who this guy is or what he's done but we're told to, to take him out are they the one that, that, that kill him, or is it the, the people that sat around that said, okay, this is a guy to go kill? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how many, how many people did Stalin kill, you know? Uh, none, or, you know, I don't know, millions. It just depends on how you, how you count it. And so, I do know that that was a significant um, responsibility. And that was, it was something that wasn't easy and it wasn't something I was going to send other people in the office to go do. Right. right? Something I felt that uh, I probably needed to, to do. I've had a couple of other, couple of other things like that where it wasn't pleasant, but I wasn't going to send somebody else to do it.